Hi. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is the underlying reason why you hear a police siren have a higher pitch as the police car comes towards you, but a lower pitch as driving away from you. It's also the reason why distant stars that are moving away from us very fast appear to have their light shifted more towards the red than um, than the actual light that they that they emit. So to start with, I just want to show you what that looks like. So I used this um, the simulation here that was made by Andrew Duffy at Boston University. And what I have here is I imagine I have this source, right? This is the blue dot is the source. You can imagine it being the police car, and then the red lines show the wave crest. So as I press play, right, this is emitting sound waves. Now those sound waves, they spread out in all directions. Right? I can't even show it in 3D, so I look at it in 2D. Um, so I can't really draw a wave as in like a wave shape ups and downs, right? So what I do instead in a situation like this, I draw just where the wave crests are, right? So the top of each wave, you can imagine this is the top of a wave, top of the next wave, next wave, and so on. So the distance from one line to the next line that's one wavelength, and they keep spreading out. So this just keeps emitting, and if you're a receiver stationed here, represented by, by this um, green bar, then those waves will reach you, and if this thing creates 100 wave crests per second, 100 hertz, um, then 100 wave crests per second are going to reach you. Right? So you hear exactly the pitch that the source is emitting you see exactly the light at that frequency at which the source is emitting. So now I'm going to set the source in motion. I'm going to imagine the source is moving to the right towards the observer. So I'm going to do it right here. Um, so the units here is just in terms of the number of times the speed of sound. So we're just going to go up to like maybe 0.2 times the speed of sound. Here it's moving. Now if you look carefully, let me pause, you notice that the wavelength on this side has become a bit shorter as the wavelength on this side behind it has become longer and, and on the sides is of somewhere in between. Right? And the reason for that, of course, is that the source itself moves. So in the time that it has um, emitted one wave crest and until it emits the next one, in that period of time, it has changed its position so the, the second wave crest gets emitted from further to the right, so it kind of gets a head start compared to the previous one. It becomes more obvious if I make the speed a bit bigger, I'm say like this, half the speed of sound, you can see very clearly now um, that the waves in front of it are a lot closer together than the waves behind it, right? because if it's going half the speed of sound, an extremely fast car, um, but you know, it could be a plane perhaps, uh, half the speed of sound means that these wavelengths here are half of what they were before when the source was just stationary, right? A half because the source has moved half the wavelength so the next wave crest that gets produced is has kind of half a wavelength of a head start. So it's only half a wavelength behind one half of the normal wavelength behind the the, the crest that came in front. But backwards, like this piece here, this piece of the wave here that's moving to the left, right? has to travel an extra half a wavelength distance because that's the distance that the source has moved. I'm going to make it precise mathematically in just a second. Um, but let me show this to you again. And of course, the bigger the speed, the more pronounced the effect. So here's 0.8 times the speed of sound. You can tell it's a lot denser here. It should mean that if it, these are sound waves, if you're in front of it, you're going to hear a very, very high pitch, whereas people behind it are going to hear a very low pitch. Because if you go back to zero, what am I doing now? Wait, zero here, then this is of the natural frequency at which this thing emits. Right? But those waves get squished in different directions depending on the motion of that source. Second thing that can happen is that the source might be stationary, but the observer might be moving. Right? So let's put the observer a bit closer and let, let the observer run away from the source. So I'm going to move the observer to maybe um, here. 
right? So right now it's closer, okay, before we hear it louder, um, but, but the pitch would be the same. But now if the observer is moving to the right, say like this, then it's sort of like the observer is running away from the waves. Now it doesn't change the physical wavelength, right, of the waves, but it changes the rate at which they arrive at the observer. If the observer was stationary, it would take, you know, one normal period for one wave crest to the next wave crest. But if the observer is moving to the right, it's like the moment the second wave crest arrives at the observer, the observer has moved, so the, the wave crest has to keep going a bit more until it finally catches up, which stretches out the period. Um, conversely, if I start the observer, say, over here, and we're going to move the observer leftwards, right, sort of you're, you're heading into the waves, so that shortens the time from one, um, from one wave crest reaching you to the next. Maybe we can do it, do it like this, so you take it a little stepwise, right, the time from one wave crest right now, to the next one here, is less than if the source was stationary, because by going towards it, you're going to reach it sooner. But essentially, you're, you're adding your speed, your velocity, to the velocity of the, um, the wave itself to cover the distance between you, to cover the wavelength, right? The speed of the wave doesn't change. The speed of the wave moves to the right. But because you're going to the left, you're shortening a distance that this wave crest has to travel to get to you. And so it's going to get there faster, so you're going to hear a higher frequency, in this case 120 hertz, and when the emission is only 100 hertz. So that's the Doppler effect. Of course, you can have a combination of the two of them, right? The source can be moving and the observer can be moving in the same direction, opposite direction. You can also move at angles to each other. That makes the math a bit more complicated. I'm not going to cover that in this video. I'm just going to worry about the, the linear arrangement where they're moving in one line towards each other away from each other. So let's do the math, let's do some examples and get to grips with this concept. So now that we've seen the effect in action, let's put it um, to numbers. So I've tried to reproduce a drawing you saw in the simulation. Um, I imagine this is my source right here and the source is moving to the right and just now as I'm taking this picture it's emitting the wave crest, that's the red one. So that ring that represents the, the top of the wave, the crest has just been emitted, a fraction of a, a tiniest fraction of a second ago. The crest that was previously emitted is the green one. When that was emitted, the source was here. So that is the center of the circle around which this one spreads out. So now I want to figure out, well, how does this motion change the wavelength, right? If the source was just stationary, that red circle would be around here, and then the wavelength would just be the distance from here to here. Let's actually make a note of this. Draw it like this. we will show you the scale. Right, this distance here is the... Let's call it lambda for wavelength, um, naught, lambda naught, the sort of original wavelength, if you like. The, the wavelength that if the thing wasn't moving, that would be the wavelength, right? Because right now, the source would be emitting another um, crest right here. Distance from this crest to this crest, well, it's, it's just that radius of the circle. I'm assuming the source is point-like. But in reality, the source has moved and the source has a certain speed. So by how far has it moved? Well, the, the time that has passed from one wave crest to the next is a period by definition. Right? The distance between those two, the distance that the source has moved, is the speed of the source times the period, right? That's the distance the source has moved. We write this out. Distance moved by source in one period. So the time it takes for one full wave cycle to be produced 
that is of course the speed of the source times the time and the time is a period right. <coughs> so that means if you're in front of here the wave the wave crest gets produced here rather than here so it gets shortened by exactly that distance right. so the um, the shortened wave crest is is going to be this one here this distance here um, we call this lambda prime sometimes see this notation as sort of the modified um, wavelength or it could be lambda received subscript rec for received um, to show this is the wavelength that's received in this case it's, it is just literally the physical wavelength right important thing to note that may not be obvious um, is that of course the speed at which the wave travels does not depend on the speed of the source right so it's different from say throwing a ball if you throw a ball while you are in motion like on the top of a truck or something um, don't do it but if you did that you'd get the momentum of the truck or rather the the velocity of the truck right that gets added to the velocity of the ball because you throw it with a certain force um, for a certain time you give it a certain um, impulse it's relative to the motion of the truck but not so for waves right the wave just travels in the medium at a speed that's determined by the medium the only thing it would change it is if you change the medium or if the medium itself moves so if there's this is air and there's a wind right that will change things up if the medium itself is moving but in this case we assume the air is still for practical purposes so once the wave has left the source it doesn't care what the source does right so only where the source is that's important and the, so now we can write down the an expression for the modified wavelength in terms of the original wavelength namely lambda prime is the original wavelength of the the hypothetical wavelength that if the source was not moving um, minus E source times t and I'm going to assume we're worried about being in front of it right if of course I'm behind it then I would have to add this distance here right I put a plus sign here it will modify the equation we're going to get to um, by a sign right so we can add that in later we're going to right now imagine ourselves being sort of positioned right here okay so this is something we could just work with right um, but we can rewrite this um, what is lambda well lambda times the frequency is the um, is the speed so i can write lambda as the speed of the wave right there's two speeds the speed of the source and the speed of the wave which is determined by the medium right you understand that um, that divided by this is the modified wavelength which is going to be the modified frequency and the frequency at prime right so this is the frequency that you would hear if you're standing here right? you hear a certain pitch of the police car siren right what you hear the pitch that is f prime the same thing here the speed of the wave doesn't change um, and i'm going to divide this by of course the frequency f naught in this case would be the frequency at which the source emits right the source you're sitting in the police car and the the, the speaker the uh, thing that produces like the siren essentially wobbles back and forth producing sound while it does it at a certain frequency that is f naught that doesn't change right but it changes because the position at which you emit one wave crest compared to the next that changes but that's still what it is minus how can i rewrite this well t is one over f and of course the time here from here to here is the the original one so i'm going to have this be um, the source over f naught right because that is the or original period like not the period that you hear the period of of the emission 
Okay, we can simplify this a little bit um, fairly straightforwardly. I can just do it right here. This is just a difference um, between the speeds. The wave speed tends to be bigger than the source speed. We're assuming this is this is the case that this is bigger than this, right? Otherwise, we'd have broken the um, the sound barrier or light barrier, I suppose. Not that it's physical. Um, to get the idea, it's for most situations this is going to be bigger than this, right? Otherwise, it's going to be as I showed you, a somewhat different situation. So I can rearrange it. I can just flip it, right? This is a fraction. This is a fraction. So I'm going to take the um, the inverse of each. So I'm going to get f prime over speed of the wave, right? This flip is equal to this flip, which is f naught divided by difference in speeds. And I can simplify this a tiny bit more. Of course, we can work with any of those expressions, right? If you want to know about wavelength, you can just use this, not worry about any of this. I'm deriving a connection between frequencies. And so I'm just going to multiply both sides by, by the speed of the wave. So I'm going to get that f prime, the modified frequency that you hear, is the original frequency divided by... Now, I multiply this side by this, the same as dividing that the um, denominator by this becomes 1 minus V source divided by V wave. So make sure you follow the algebra here, but it's just algebra. And so this is an expo important expression. Um, this is for an approaching source. Let me write this down. Source is approaching. If I were behind it, if I were here and the source was getting away from me, well, it's easy enough, then this would be a plus. This would be a plus. This would be a plus. Let me write this in. Um, so this is my, my second person right here. Purple. Then this would be would be a plus, this would be a plus, this would be a plus, and this would be a plus, and this would be a plus. Um, so maybe I should just write it in small letters above it, right, so that it's, it's corresponding to the, the orientation. Um, source is receding. That's the little purple sign. Of course, you, if you get lost, and it's a fairly frequent question they get, well, how do I remember which sign is which? I mean, maybe you just use it enough. But here's what you know. You know that if you're in front of it, the frequency should go up. You hear the, the waves come in faster. If you're behind it, the frequency should go down, the further apart. It takes longer for a full cycle to reach your, your eardrum, right? So which sign makes the frequency bigger, which sign makes the frequency smaller? Well, to make this bigger, the denominator, this is bigger than this, the denominator has to be smaller than 1, so minus is if you're in front, right? So you don't have to sort of <coughs> remember it via some, some rule or be worried that you forget. You can always figure it out again which is the right sign. Right? I hope that, that makes sense. All right, let's do an example. Here's our example. Let's stick for now with police cars. Um, a police car races straight towards you while you're waiting at a street corner. Um, but to your relief, it's not coming for you. It passes you and then drives away from you in a straight line. You know the car moves at a constant 42.5 meters per second. And as it approaches you, right, in its way as it's, you see it coming towards you, you hear its siren at a frequency of 720 hertz question is, what pitch What pitch do you hear um, after the police car has passed you? Well, let's think about this. What are we given? We're given the frequency that we hear right, as the car approaches us. So that's the frequency that is modified by the Doppler effect. It is not the frequency at which the police car emits its wave. It's not what if the car was just parked there, right, that would not be the frequency. That is the frequency you hear 
as a result of the Doppler effect. So our plan is going to be, we're going to figure out what is the actual natural frequency of the police car siren, like at what frequency does it, does it emit its, um, its sound. And then we're going to have a separate second step, then we're going to figure out, well, what do we hear then as driving away from us, going the other way. Let's apply our the equation we have derived. So on approach, what do we have on the approach? The line here. Um, on the approach, I have that, well, f prime, let me call it f received this time, because it's um, f received, it's the frequency here, same as f prime. We just figured out in our equation right here, that this is F naught, the unknown frequency that at which the siren naturally emits, divided by one. Um, it's it's approaching us, and we use the minus sign. One minus this. It's going to be F zero, the unknown, divided by one minus V, the source is the car divided by the speed of sound. Of course, we have to know the speed of sound for this. And in normal conditions, like in air at sort of a pleasant temperature, 20 degrees C or so, um, it's about 340 meters per second. Now, that's a useful number to, to remember. You don't have to remember it. You know, I'm not going to ask you in an exam what is the speed of sound. You'd be given it, but it's just useful to have um, handy for the sort of back of the envelope daily life calculations that you might might do over lunch. So this is going to be the annotated in a different color. Speed of sound is 340 meters per second. It could be 343 is often quoted as another number. It doesn't matter too much. The speed of the car is given to us, 42.5 meters per second. This is unknown, right? But we know this one. And this is 720 hertz. So we can just do a little bit of algebra. I'm not going to bore you with that. Right? We're going to do some algebra. Now, 42.5 over 340, um, that is uh, actually, it, it works out to be exactly one eighth. Um, so, you do the math and you're going to find that F0, the frequency at which the, the siren emits, is, is equal to 630 hertz. Right. So this is the emission frequency of the siren. But we are not done, right? That is not the answer because after the cars passed that, past us, it's not just standing there, it's driving away from us. So, on um, recession, on departure, so on departure, while it's receding, I guess, would be the technical term, um, the, the receive frequency, perhaps we should label those a bit further, this is, this is as we're approaching, this is as we're receding, Let's call it departing. Um, it's going to be, well, F naught, right? Then one, this time it's plus V car over V sound. What do I know now? Well, those values down here, they're still the same. 42.5 meters per second. This was 340 meters per second. And now I know this one, right? This is. Um, this is this, so I just found it there. I plug it in. So I can figure out what is the the frequency that I receive, subscript REC, rec, um, F prime, I called it earlier. Let's not get hung up on specific symbols. What's the frequency that I hear? I plug in the numbers and I should find, unless I made a mistake, um, this should be 500. And 60 hertz. Eight ninth of this. Uh, 
All right, so that's an example of applying um, what we just derived. So now we ask, well, what if you observe us moving? So let's take this picture here. This is my source. Enable it. And the source is now stationary. Of course, realistically, we could have a lot of situations where both the source and the observer move, but let's just deal with one at a time. So the source is emitting waves, and these are perfect circles all around the same spot because the source isn't moving, right? So what's crucial here is the wavelength here is never changed, right? In the case of a moving source, the physical distance, you freeze time, you measure the distance between the wave crests, that's changed. In the case of a moving observer, that's not changed, right? Because the, the waves, they don't care when they get observed, it's only the an appearance what the observer appears to to measure has changed. Um, so this of course would be would be just one wavelength. Okay, one wavelength, one wavelength, one wavelength. So let's imagine the observer right now is here and the observer is going to move to here and by the time the observer gets here, right, so the observer has a has a velocity to the right, let's call it V ops for observer. By the time the observer gets to here, that is when the next wave crest has caught up with it. So we are assuming that the um, wave, of course, moves faster than the observer. So right now I call this wave crest crest A. Right now crest A is here. Crest B is going to catch up. We assume it's going to catch up there. But the important thing to notice is that it'd be wrong to say just multiply the um, the like speed by one period and add that to the wavelength or something like that, right? That's not going to work. We don't know the exact time when this happens. We can't just, just read it off. But let's write down an equation to determine it. So the time from here to here from is when the wave crest A is received to wave crest B is received. That is, of course, the received period, the apparent period, right? Um, so, so time... time from, um, let me do color code this, the time from here to here, right, that time is the, the received period, the observed period, let's call it that. By definition, from one wave crest to the next, how much time has passed? And we can already see this is going to be longer than the time it would have taken if we, the observer just had been stationary. It would have just been, okay, how long does this one take to get to here? Wave speed over lambda, right? But in this case, the observer sort of escaping, so it's going to take a bit longer. But let's write down what we know. So in that time, we're going to call this time t prime. In that time, the observer has has moved a um, a distance speed of the observer times the time. The wave here has moved that distance plus one wavelength. So, the distance traveled by this wave, right, is going to be equal to V of the wave times the time period um, from those two events, between those two events. So, T prime, right, that's the distance traveled by, the, by a wave crest B. Let me write this down. Distance traveled by crest B. I hope that makes sense to you. Right? That's equal to, well, to one wavelength, right from here to here, plus the distance traveled by the observer. That's, of course, just V observer times T prime. Okay. So now, Again, we can just maybe work with this, depending what sort of quantities we're given, what we know. Let's rewrite those, though, um, algebraically. I can rewrite this as the 
speed of the wave, right, that doesn't change ever, divided by the received frequency f prime, t prime is 1 over f prime, right, that's going to be equal to, but what's lambda? Um, that's the speed of the wave divided by the the original frequency, right, that um, if you'd been stationary, that's the frequency you would have you would have observed. And we could add this part here plus V observe over F prime again. T prime is one over F prime. So let's rearrange that. You want to find F prime in terms of F zero. So I'm going to take this to the other side. I'm going to get V wave minus v observer over f prime, right? Those two fractions become one. It's equal to the speed of the wave divided by f naught. I can flip the fractions and I get that f prime is equal to v wave minus v observer divided by um, sorry divided by I flipped the fractions divided by v wave times f naught um, I could we could leave it there or I could rewrite this as one minus v observer um, over um, over v wave. of the wave, right, um, exactly identical. Let me write down this as sort of the, the final result. Again, had we been moving the other way, right, I would just flip the signs, so um, then I'd be putting a, a minus sign here, because the distance would have been shortened by, by, that, by that distance if the, the observer were moving the, in the opposite direction. This would have been a minus sign. This would have made this a plus sign. This would have made this a plus sign. This a plus sign. Right. So. So in in this case we were um, receding from the source. And with the plus sign. It is approaching the source. So the source is not approaching, we are approaching the source. Right. Again, you can you don't have to remember this, you don't have to remember which one is which. I mean if you just remember this expression but you can't remember the signs, again you can check. Well I know that if I'm running away from the source, the frequency should be lower. If I'm going towards the source, the frequency should be higher. It'll tell you right away which sign um, you should be using. All right, let's work an example on that too. Here's the example. Imagine you're in a boat. Here you are rowing. You have a speed of two meters per second going to the left, and the waves, meanwhile, they're moving at three meters per second to the right. And you've got a wavelength of six meters question is how many times a minute do you bob up and down now if you were not moving right you're just at rest sitting there you take a break from the rowing the answer would be fairly simple three meters per second that means well it's half of six so half a wave full cycle per second so two seconds per cycle so that's 30 times a minute which hopefully that calculation would be easy for you but now the, the boat is, is moving Right, the bodice is moving to the to the left. Now we could plug this stuff into the equation we just derived, or we could just think about it. Right, what's the answer? Well, with the boat moving to the left, it's essentially the same as the waves moving to the right, not with three meters per second, but with three meters per second plus two. Right, we're sort of shifting our frame of reference to say, well, Relative to to me rowing, the waves are moving five meters per second to the right. Let's write this down. Right. 
guess it's not me, it's you, right? Relative to you, the waves appear to move at 3 meters per second plus 2 meters per second, which is 5 meters per second to the right. But nothing wrong with that changing our frame of reference. So I hope this makes sense to you, right? If not, post the video now, think about it. All right. So that means, how long is it going to take from one wave crest to the next? Well, it's six meters, right? The speed in my frame of reference is five meters per second. Uh, so how long does that take? Well, so time from one crest to the next. Well, this, this is my t prime, right? That's the perceived period. It's going to be the distance divided by the speed. So it's lambda over um, v wave plus v boat. Of course, we worked already out what that is. That is 5, right? So it's 6 meters divided by 5 meters per second, which comes to 1.2 seconds. All right, let's double check. Does this make sense? If I go 5, if the waves go 5 meter per second, or, I, mean, I know the wave is going 3 meters, I'm going 2 meters, but together, waves and you together cover 5 of those 6 meters in 1 second. Um, then it's going to take one second plus one fifth of that again to cover the last meter. It's indeed 1.2 seconds. Okay. So if that is the time for um, for one full wave cycle, for once going up and down, then how many times a minute are we going to do that? Well, a minute has 60 seconds. Number of times um, this happens in one minute it's going to be um, 60 seconds divided by 1.2 seconds right because we're asking what how many times 1.2 is 60 so 60 over 1.2 which of course comes to 50 times and that's our final answer. All right, now there are just a couple more minor points I want to make about the Doppler effect. Then I'm going to make a separate video, um, sort of a little extra, in which I go through another application of this stuff, an example, if you will, but a little more, in, it's a little bit more involved. Um, and we're going to look at some astrophysics application on how I can find out properties of distant star systems by by looking at the light right and how the doppler effect allows us to infer things about how the stars are moving for example so i'm going to do that example in a separate video uh, before i go there just let me make maybe three more short um, notes the first one is what about other angles so we had sources moving straight towards us, straight away from us. But what, a, what about them moving at some, some funny direction, right? So imagine this is you, and here's the source, and it's moving this way. Right. So what happens then? I mean, clearly the waves, they're going to be sort of deformed. It's like you're off to the side. I'm not going to do the math for you. There's an expression for it, and essentially involves the the angle relative to you, you can figure it out. You can look it up, right? I'm not going to um, test you on this. It's not going to come up, but it's a thing that's out there, right? And it just modifies the equation of derivation, derivation slightly, slightly more complicated. But um, just think about it, right? Ultimately, you want to figure out what's the rate of change of distance between the source and you, right? So what is the rate of change of these distances? The first point, and um, that's out there for you to look up, for you to figure out maybe, if you're feeling ambitious. The second point is, if you're going really fast, 
and this usually just applies to light. Um, there's something called the relativistic Doppler effect. which it, this really applies when you're going at a significant fraction of the speed of light. Um, of C, right? C being the symbol used for the, the speed of light. So you know, at least several thousand um, kilometers a second. Probably not going to come up, right, in... In your life as it were but you know it, it has effect so there are places where it can't be ignored um the point is there if that happens then we have to use special relativity and special relativity well there's a doppler effect like we know except there's an additional effect that of so-called time dilation where the rate at which time passes or what rate at which clocks tick if you want a more sort of pragmatic way of thinking about it um, that is modified and it is of course going to affect the oscillations that are that produce the wave like the, the change the meaning of time for the source as compared to the observer it has an additional effect again like with this one look it up right we'll cover that in a course on special relativity um, sadly not this course we don't have time for it it's a lot of stuff we'd have to cover first has one more thing now, um, and that is what happens if you do move faster than the speed of the wave? If the source, let's say, moves faster than the speed of the wave? Not possible with light, but with sound, things can go faster than sound. So what happens? Let me show that again with the simulation. Finally, I just want to come back to this simulation here one last time and show you what happens when the source moves faster than the speed of the wave in the medium. Now, for some waves it's not going to happen, such as for, for light, for example. It's light in vacuum. Light moving in the medium, you can technically move faster, and then very interesting things happen. Um, but that's really graduate level physics. Um, of course, I want you to do that, but not right here, right now. All right, so... Let's have a look. I have this source as before, and I'm going to make it go faster than the speed of sound. We mentioned these are sound waves. So what's going to happen? Let's have a look. We're going to do it first by not going faster than the speed of sound, but by going just very close to the speed of sound. We're going to work our way there. So here we go. So here's my source. It's stationary, right? And right now, we just hear exactly the pitch, the frequency that is emitted by the source. Now. We're going to go to 0.9 times the speed of sound. Right, so here it's moving. You can tell what's happening. Those waves in front, they get super squished together. It really raises the pitch a lot. Right, so you hear a very high tone. It will be very loud. Um, now, if I go to exactly the speed of sound, what's going to happen then? Let's have a look. So now, all those wave crests that get emitted by the source and move to the right, they all just build up on top of each other, right? Because the the source creates a, a wave crest, and then the next crest builds up on top and on top and on top and on top. So the wave just adds to itself. Like you're sort of walking along next to it, and you're just adding to it, making it bigger. So all those waves on top of each other, they're interfering with each other, um, but in a constructive way. We'll talk about interference more in the near future. But hopefully you can see that essentially they all add up on top of each other, which means you've got this giant pressure wave, right? The pressure difference is going to be huge. Remember, sound is, of course, um, air pressure changes. So you're getting this, this pressure shock wave reaching you. And so when you breach the sound barrier, meaning you move faster, you go at a speed of sound, you start moving faster at the speed of sound, you can hear this so-called sonic boom. And that is this giant loud noise that's created by having all those sound waves stack up on top of each other. Right, so here we go. And then it all arrived together at the, um, at the observer. All right. Now let's go faster than the speed of sound. Let's go 1.2 times the speed of sound. Okay, what do you observe now? How does that look? So 
the sewers creates, you know, waves, wave crests, and they spread out in a circular fashion from the point where the source emitted them, right? Once the waves have left the source, they don't care what the source does. But one consequence then is that the wa one wave crest gets emitted, say this one here, and then the next one gets emitted from a point that's so far to the right of it that the wave crest moving to the right of this one is already further ahead than the wave crest moving to the right that's part of this circle here. So what the implication is, is that the, the sound waves arrive in the wrong order. Right? They arrive at a different, um, different frequency that depends on exactly how fast is that thing moving, but also they, they, they arrive in reverse. Right? The ones that the part of the wave that gets emitted last, say this crest here, arrives before this crest, before this one, before this one. So at least in theory, if you were to play some piece of music and you do this, um, you'd hear the music backwards, like as it arrives here. Of course, there are also sort of practical problems with this. You'd cover a very large distance in a very short amount of time. Um, and and so, the, the for example, the the volume level at which you hear it, right, how loud is it, that would change hugely in a very short amount of time, right? So you can't actually hear a piece of music backwards. In principle, right, though, um, you can. Let's watch it, but keep watching it, what happens, right? So you can see, and let's go a lot faster. Let's go twice the speed of sound. You can really see how each um, circle representing a wave crest gets emitted in such a way that the front of it is way ahead of the, the next one back there. So they really arrive um, backwards. In fact, if you go twice the speed of sound, um, I mean, it tells you the answer here, frequency is, is minus 100 hertz, you, you hear the same frequency except you hear it backwards. Right? You hear the, the sound wave backwards. Um, so you know, that's fun. Now what happens if the observer moves faster than the speed of sound? So let me just put the source back at zero. So the source is just there. Um, actually, zero is source velocity. Right? And I'm going to move the observer very close to the source. So I'm going to start maybe at minus, minus 40. And then we go, let, the, let the observer move at the speed of sound. Now, if this happens, you can tell the sound never actually reaches the observer. If the um, the sound wave sort of was emitted before the observer starts moving, and I can't really show this to you in the simulation, then the, the observer would just ride on a single, um, say, wave crest. But there, therefore, there would be no oscillation on the eardrum of the observer because it always just have the same pressure you're sort of running along with the with the wave crest and so you wouldn't hear anything either if you go fast in the speed of sound in the opposite direction start here i mean really here nothing special happens you get a huge frequency shift right more than twice here more than twice the frequency um, the, of the original emission, but but in a way there's no special effect, no special phenomenon that occurs. Same thing if the source was moving away from you. If the observer was moving away from the source faster than the speed of sound, let's make that happen. I'm going to start the observer really close, actually maybe in the same spot even, and then when if the observer move faster than the speed of sound, now again, here the observer is not going to hear anything because the observer is running away from the, the initial sound wave. But if the sound had started earlier and now the observer was starting to move, again, the observer would sort of catch up with the sound and, and run through the sound waves backwards. Different little effects um, that you get. The main one that, that happens that is, is of the highest relevance um, for actual occurrences is where the source 
moves fast in the speed of sound and then you get these sonic booms and other effects occur such as a lot of water droplets form again it's to do with the pressure so you actually see those um, look at some pictures there might be pictures in your textbook even all right this is the follow-up from the main doppler effect and you can work through the math to see how does this look mathematically nothing more profound here you might get infinities or zeros with the frequency right but you can interpret what those mean all right thanks for watching